everybody, Gavin McCormack here. We are in South Georgia at one of the largest king penguin colonies on Earth with around about 30,000 couples. And we are with John, who is an ornithologist. How are you, John? Hi, Gavin. Very well, thank you. Now, this week, we're talking all about birds. And in the Antarctic region, birds are pretty big, John. Yeah, these guys are pretty big, up to 90 centimetres tall. So these are the second largest penguin, the king penguin. That's right. But we're talking about birds that fly oh, this of week. Course. And of course. in particular, we're talking about the albatross. Now, the albatross is known for its great feats of flight. It can fly for great distances in its lifetime, around about 7 million kilometres. Tell us, John, where will we find albatross, wandering albatross in particular? Well, wandering albatross spend their lives at sea. They only come to land to breed, and they breed on sub-Antarctic islands, like here at South Georgia, and um, Macquarie Island, Gough Island, Marion Island, a number of islands that are between uh, Australia, South America, and Africa, and Antarctica. Wow, now they're amazing flyers. What makes them so good at flying? Well, they actually glide very efficiently. They've got what are known as high aspect ratio wings. That means long, thin wings that are very efficient for, for gliding. And uh, something to do with their bones. Are their bones solid like ours? No, all birds have hollow bones, and so that makes them light and helps them to fly. Now, I saw some last week, and their wings didn't seem to move at all. Is there something they do special with their wings that, that other birds don't do? So the albatrosses can actually lock their humerus, their upper arm bone, into their shoulder and that way they can keep their wings out all day long and not use any effort at all. Goodness me, I understand it's the same amount of energy consumed as if they were just sitting down relaxing. Around about the same, yes. <laughs> so amazing. Incredibly efficient, yeah. Now they're big birds, really big. I mean they can get up to two and a half, three meters in, in, in wingspan. Yeah. What do they eat to become so big? Well, they, they feed mostly on squid. The wandering albatross eats squid. It'll also eat fish and some crustaceans. And they sit on the surface of the water, paddling their feet. And then when they see a squid, they just plunge down and pick it out of the water. Amazing. Now, when do they hunt? Is it in the daytime or in the night? Mostly in the nighttime, when the squid come closer to the surface. Ah, right. I understand they use something to do with their feet. They paddle the water, and this is uh, apparently attracts the squid to come to that's, the surface. That's one of the theories as to how they are able to catch the squid, is that the squid may be attracted to their paddling feet. Now, we've been talking about the food chain and the food web, and how everything is connected from phytoplankton to primary consumers to secondary and then up at the apex. Do these birds have any predators? I imagine they'd be taken occasionally by orcas, but they're, they're pretty close to the top of the food chain. There's not a lot that eats a wandering albatross. Right, I understand that. Now, the, there is a lot of water around here. There's a lot of ice, a lot of seawater. There is some fresh water. How do birds like this drink? Well, these birds are actually at home on the sea. They get their food and their water from the sea. So they drink seawater and they have a special salt gland behind their eyes that enables them to filter the salt out of their blood and they then excrete it through a tube in their bill. Right. What, do these kind of birds have a special name? They do. They've got, they're called tube noses. Oh. And that includes the albatrosses, the petrels, the shearwaters and the fulmars. Right, now there are other, some other big birds around here as well. The giant petrel, for example, is almost as big as the wandering albatross. Why do they tend to hang around colonies such as these here? The giant petrel is a scavenger and also a predator, so it's hoping to get sick or injured animals or eggs. So it hangs around here hoping that something's going to die so it can eat it. Oh, goodness me. Now, these king penguins around us here have just given birth. Their little penguin chicks have headed off into the water with their beautiful brown fluff, and they look very cute indeed. But the albatross, how does that actually rear its chicks? Who looks after the egg? How do they lay their nests? Where do they put them? Both the male and the female look after the egg and the chick. So when the female lays the egg, she then goes to sea to feed and the male looks after the egg. And um, when the egg hatches, the female comes back and feeds the chick and the male goes off and feeds himself and then brings food back for the chick. And how do they feed the chick? I mean, what's the, do they bring the fish back alive and feed it? I mean, how does that work? They have in their throat what's known as a crop. It's a little pouch on the side of their throat and they swallow food for themselves to their stomach and then they swallow food to the crop, which they can then regurgitate for the chick. And regurgitating is basically vomiting? 
Yeah, very similar. Wow, and how long does it take for a baby uh, to grow, a baby chick to grow into a fully fledged albatross that can fly into the sky and so fend for itself? The wandering albatross, it takes about a year. So two, two and a half months for the egg to hatch and then another nine and a half or 10 months for that uh, chick to be reared to a stage when it can fly itself. And will they meet again or is the last time they'll see each other when the baby flies off for the first time? The baby probably won't meet its parents again, but the parents mate for life. And so they come back every two years to the same spot and meet the same partner. So amazing. Now this bird in particular is a phenomenal flyer. As we've already learned, it can fly around about 7 million kilometers in its lifetime. That is extremely far. It can even fly for several hours without even flapping its wings. As John said, it locks its humerus in and doesn't even need to flap at all. Now, these animals have been inspirational for scientists for a very, very long time. In fact, if you look at a modern aeroplane or fighter jet, you will see that they are very similar to some of the birds that we see, like the Arctic Tern or the Albatross, they're very streamlined. And what we have learned is that nature can teach us a valuable lesson in fact how we can develop our own scientific developments. And this week, we want you to find out how science has been influenced by nature. A few weeks ago, we learned about elephant seals, John. And elephant seals kick up the sand from the beach yeah. and use it as sun cream, which is also something that we do when we're walking to the sun. So this is a scientific development. This week, we want you to find out all the ways in which nature has influenced science. And we are going to learn, just like a scientist, about how nature can teach us. John, it has been a pleasure. Thanks, Kevin. Thank and we'll you very see much. you all next week. Goodbye.